Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. Q&A is taking a break for New Year's weekend, and we want to share an interview we did recently with longtime college administrator John Agresto, who is an ardent champion of liberal arts education. In his latest book, The Death of Learning, Dr. Agresto argues that political correctness and an emphasis on skill-based learning has devalued the study of the liberal arts. He asks how we can rediscover the value of liberal arts education, believing it will benefit individual students and our society. Q&A will be back with new episodes on January 8th, 2023. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. John Agresto, author of the new book, The Death of Learning, How American Education Has Failed Our Students and What to Do About It. We're going to talk about the value of liberal arts education and what you see as the threats to it. But I really wanted to start by talking about you. I looked online at your career, and you've got a number of different things listed. A political scientist by training, you've been a college professor, college president, acting chair of the National Endowment for Humanities during the Lynn Cheney and William Bennett days, advisor to the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq, an administrator at the American University in the Kurdish region of Iraq, an author, the chair of the New Mexico Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and a probate judge for Santa Fe County. So is there a through line with all of those different things you've done that links them all together? Yeah, I can't seem to keep a job for very long. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's uh, a desire to know as much as I can about as many different things as I can and to use those in, in service. Uh, yeah, I think that's that covers it. Of those positions, is there one that was the most foundational to you in the development of your worldview? Uh, they all contributed. That's the nice thing about the liberal arts is it, it, it adds things from so many different sides and places. A uh, couple of things were eye-opener. Uh, studying, uh, I have to say this, I loved my high school. I loved my high school education. It opened up the world to me. I was just a, a little Italian American kid growing up in in what used to be Red Hook. Now Red Hook's become Shishi, but it wasn't Shishi then. Uh, and I uh, I saw the I, 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 even though I called it a sappy poem, and it is Emily Dickinson when she says uh, there is no frigate like a book to take us lands away. I got taken to lands away. Uh, I didn't have to. I didn't have to get on a plane, or I didn't even have to get on the Staten Island ferry. I could see the world because I had books. Uh, that was that education where I learned everything from, you know, Latin to biology and all the sciences, mathematics, uh, uh, French, uh, history, uh, yeah, political economy. It was a, it was a great like like Anthony Fauci a great. A great Jesuit liberal arts education. Uh, again, in the death of learning, I'm not sure it's still that available, at least not where it used to be. Second, uh, studying political science. Uh, it wasn't political science like the world knows political science, you know, uh, polls and uh, uh, you know, power structures and, and inter intergovernmental relations. It was more or less... Uh, Principles of politics, principles of of of, uh, of political uh, political philosophy, and an awful lot of reading of things like uh, the Federalist Papers, understanding the Constitution, reading Thucydides, learning about politics at the deepest level, uh, and then the last thing that that I I, I this took me totally by surprise. Uh, I have a friend who told me once that the most satisfying thing to do as an educator is to teach post-tyranny children, post-tyranny, you know, adolescents. And he was doing this in, in uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. Uh, when I went to Iraq, and these were students to whom the idea of learning about things that weren't 
forced on you for political or religious reasons, learning about the world, learning to see the world in all its wonder, in all its complexity, and indeed in all its in all its understandable and ununderstandable ways, uh, they took to that. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that there was an education that that taught them to to wonder, an education that taught them to think, taught them to question, and taught them to learn. Uh, and they were absolutely thrilled with this. Uh, now, still, in the end, many of them uh, used, the, used the liberal arts as a way of getting into uh, what now is even over there as it is here. Uh, things like computer science and the health uh, healthcare industries, wonderful things in themselves. Uh, but they weren't forced into those fields. They understood the world better. They understood themselves better. They understood their country better. They understood other countries better. Uh, and they understood their neighbors better. Uh, and uh, to watch that, to watch that, that, that wide-eyed growth was just Im incredible to me. So what is the argument that you are making in the death of learning? Uh, you know, I'm trying to make an argument for the, for the, uh, uh, both to be, I'm trying to be both critical of the liberal arts as they are today, uh, uh, critical of those who teach the liberal arts in the, in either the most old fashioned ways or even worse, I, I think, uh, uh, teach the liberal arts uh, in ways that uh, are simply, uh, to bear, take a word from critical thinking, that are simply, simply critical, uh, that the liberal arts teaches you to sneer, that the liberal arts teaches you that, that you are ever so smart and ever so good and, and getting ever so better. Uh, uh, I hate the pretense of the liberal arts. Uh, the liberal arts don't make us finer. They don't make us they don't make us holier. They don't make us uh, uh, more liberal. Uh, uh, they don't make us more conservative, although both sides think the other side is saying that. Uh, the liberal arts just teach us to understand things that matter, teach us about the world, about ourselves, about nature, about, about things. I begin, I studied with Alan Bloom, and Alan Bloom's book, The Closing American Mind, talks about the most interesting thing about adolescents is the yearnings they have. And he didn't mean just the yearnings to be with, you know, uh, a guy or a gal, opposite sex or whatever it might be. The yearning they had to know what love was, to learn what hate was, to learn what justice might be, to, to, uh, to see what, what mercy might be, to see what, if God exists. Not to know those things hard and fast, although that might happen, but to learn what the what the arguments are, what the alternative arguments are, not just your own arguments, to see your life and to see the life of of, of others and to see the alternatives to how you currently live them, it teaches you to be uh, at its best. Uh, it's a liberal education. It means uh, not that you should take courses willy nilly. Uh, that's in some ways the opposite of being free. That's being that's being enchained to your to your current opinions and desires and thinking you know what you what you really should like, but when you might not. Uh, but liberal in the sense that it frees you from slavishness opinions of others, sl slavery to the opinions of others, and it frees you from thinking that you know everything when, of course, you don't. Uh, and so it enables you, it, en it enables you to, to, to expand your horizons and see, and see uh, opinions and truth a little more widely. Uh, now, where was I going with this? Well, I'll uh, tell you, but you, you acknowledge in the book um, and, and also some pieces I've seen you in, published in other places that by publishing this topic right now, you jump right into the big fray of debate and discussion, often angry in this country, uh, about the direction of education. What's been the reaction so far to the argument that you make? Oh, uh, as with all my books, uh, I always I begin I began my first book a long time ago in eighty two or eighty four by saying you know this is going to make enemies on all sides I you know I like that that's okay uh, if uh, if if uh, many people agree with me I'm happy if everybody agrees with me I'd be certain I was wrong uh, and so 
uh, I the, the uh, people in the people who have a very high opinion of the of the the liberal art. Well, let's put it this way: uh, people who think that the liberal arts are instrumental, instrumental in pushing the agendas that they have, whether they're right wing agendas or left wing agendas. Uh, the liberal arts have always been the the, uh, uh, the the plaything, in a sense, of those who have a political agenda in the in our universities. Uh, uh, that I make uh, uh, I make certainly enemies there because I'm trying to make a a, a, a non political defense of the liberal arts. Uh, where I don't want to make enemies is where the liberal arts tend to want to make enemies which is people who are teaching or studying uh, professional, vocational, technical subjects. Uh, yeah. Some of those, those people know something that I think is important, that sometimes those things not only are, are good for you as a, as a person, let's say uh, you study uh, agronomy because you really want to be a good farmer. Uh, you, you, you want to know all about computers. Uh, uh, you want to know all about finance and accounting. You want to know all about you name it. Uh, and those people also, in doing that, have some view on how they might help others through, by helping themselves. I think that's a model for what the liberal arts should be. How do we use the liberal arts? And I have no trouble with the word you use in connection with the liberal arts. They're not some kind of, of crystal thing up there uh, that that you that you worship. It's a, it's it's they they're arts, they're skills, they're in a, in a sense tools. Uh, using the liberal arts to make ourselves smarter. I don't think they make us better that necessarily. Uh, although in some ways they make us more open to the world, which is a good thing, and they may moderate our expectations of ourselves in the world, which is a very good thing. Uh, they make me, us better in that sense, certainly smarter in that sense. And I wanted to show how the liberal arts might help, if nothing else, the country. I mean, the students in Iraq understood that by studying history, uh, by studying philosophy, by studying literature, uh, uh, basic subjects in the liberal arts, uh, they could be of immense help to their country. Uh, before that, they were told what to think. Uh, they, it, when, when the liberal arts were taught, they were taught with a political edge. Uh, I remember uh, when a, a group of orphans that I spoke to at an orphanage there when I asked them, you know, did they study any? They all knew they all knew English. Was Saddam wanted wanted his people to understand English? Of course, that was English was power. Uh, not that he wanted to empower them, but he wanted to use them to empower him. Uh, uh, that they studied uh, Shakespeare and Dickens. I said, well, that's that's interesting. In fact, that's wonderful. What did you study? Is they said uh, we studied. Uh, 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 this guy, uh, we read about this guy Cratchit, and and we read and we read the Shakespeare. We read the Merchant of Venice with that guy Shylock. I said, okay, there's there's something going on here where the 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 liberal arts are being used in a political, anti-Israeli, anti-Jewish agenda, and the answer was clearly yes. Uh, that's what. Everybody wants to do, go to the me and, a, and you know, a few of my friends. Uh, that's what everybody wants to do with the liberal arts. Use them for an agenda. Use them for their political uh, or, or religious or ideological purposes. That's what's killing the liberal arts. Uh, in a sense, the liberal arts are being killed by things that are also good. The study of practical, professional things. Uh, that's always been the case. We've always been a nation uh, uh, more interested in in the useful than the fine, more interested in 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 doing than knowing. Uh, but that's not really our biggest problem right now. Our biggest problem is within the universities, uh, where uh, the, the the liberal arts are not are not liberating. In fact, 
Well, let me put it this way. Uh, uh, as a professor, I always thought my job was to, to help kids understand their own mind, that, to better their own mind, to improve their mind, to expand their mind, to see the arguments on all sides. Uh, uh, I never wanted to, I wanted to free their minds. I didn't want to capture their minds. Uh, and, uh, and that's one of my best professors once when I said something in class, uh, uh, said, you know, I, I used to think that way myself, but then I thought about this, blah, 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 blah. Well, why didn't you think about that? And then we'll talk about it. I, no, not preaching, not anything, just telling me, think about, think about the breadth of human learning. Think about, about all sides of an issue. That's real education. And you go to so many places right now, whether it's a, uh, well, I'm not even going to name, whatever the agenda of the day seems to be, whatever the cause du jour is, uh, uh, that seems to be what the, they're using the liberal arts to push. So what would a solid foundational set of courses in the liberal arts look like? I think we've gotten used to the idea that the liberal arts cover certain subjects, both in the humanities, in the sciences, and to a degree in the social sciences. So a foundational, not course, but a foundational program of studies, let's say, uh, would cover... Uh, great literature, uh, poetry, fiction, drama, would study, would study, uh, uh, give us a, ha give our students a handle on the sciences, uh, chemistry, biology, uh, would teach us something about uh, philosophy, especially moral and political philosophy, would teach us, and this was sort of the beginning of the, of the loss, would teach us something about Western civilization. That course, the course in Western civilization, was almost always the, the introductory core course to the liberal arts. Uh, so you begin with, with, with the Greeks, and you begin with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Judaism, and you move on to Christianity. You, will, you will go from there to the Romans. You go from there to the Renaissance, to the, uh, to the Reformation. Uh, you go from there to the Age of Discovery. That were important things that left because, let me put it this way, kids have to know two things. They have to know what's theirs, what's their own, the ground of it, the reasons for it, the, the, the goodness of it, the evil of it, the greatness of it, the failings of it. They have to know their own, uh, and they have to know what's not their own. They have to know what the alternatives to their own are. Uh, uh, in my field in political science, you have to know what the, what the alternatives to democracy are, but also the arguments for democracy have to know the uh, alternatives to the rule of law and constitutionalism. It's, you have to know, but you have to know the, the value of it as well, or at least the arguments for it. Uh, so uh, I think I think those those things are important. But but it may put it in, in this kind of framework. I talked before about freeing our minds, freeing our imagination, freeing us from the slavery. Uh, to the, uh, to, the, to the opinions of others and, and freeing us from, in, in hopefully, from our own unthought through opinions as well. Uh, but, but freedom is only part of the liberal arts. The other part uh, that, that everybody always senses is it, it has a freeing function, it has a conserving function. It preserves great books, great authors, great ideas, great arguments. Uh, it's a, it has a totally uh, uh, preserve, conservative, preservative uh, part in the world. And that may seem paradoxical. It's both liberating and conserving. But, you know, that paradox is true. That's what the, that was the, the incredible gift of the liberal arts, that it could both uh, teach you how to play music and how to compose if you would, but can also teach you uh, Beethoven and Mozart and Palestrina. Uh, it, it, just an amazing, uh, it was an amazing gift that was built up over centuries that we were handing our students in, the, in, in today's world, and somehow we lost it. 
Well, you describe in the book a threshold event and the direction the liberal arts have taken over the past couple decades. At Stanford in the 1980s, when the big protest on campus is Western Civ has got to go. What happened then and why was it so, so uh, game changing? It really was game changing, and, I'm, and I get I get uh, I get criticized even by my friends to say, "Gresto, stop living in the past." That was forty years ago. I think that was a pivotal moment forty years ago. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it was game changing because for the first time, uh, maybe not for the first time, but for the first important time, what was considered foundational in the in the liberal arts, namely that we would know something about two thousand years of of this civilization's development, its, its, its growth, its values, its greatness, what it accomplished, uh, what its promise was, and so on, uh, that, that there were those political forces uh, that said, we, we have our own uh, uh, things that need to be studied. Uh, and the basis, or in other words, the basis of this civilization since we don't like this civilization, we think Western civilization is is oppressive. We think Western civilization is is racist, misogynist, whatever it might be. Since we don't like this civilization, we, for reasons uh, of our own, wish it not to be taught. And in its place, we will put uh, a new kind of multiculturalism. Uh, no, I have no problem with the idea of multiculturalism. In fact. Uh, uh, the liberal arts had always been multicultural. That's what made them great in a sense. You could study antiquity and, and contemporary. Uh, you could study the ancients. You could study Greek and Latin. You could study modern English and modern French. I mean, it's uh, you can study ancient civil, civilization and modern civilization. Uh, so it wasn't the idea of multiculturalism. It was the idea of using the idea of multiculturalism not to study this culture. That was the problem. Uh, and it not only went there, but it went to the other thing that now you can find very, only rarely on college campuses, uh, uh, foundational courses in American history. Uh, a lot of reasons for this, not just multiculturalism, although that's the main reason. Uh, but we're talking about foundational courses, which means that the professor really has to not get up and talk about a lecture about his latest research project. Uh, he has to talk, or, or, or the latest turn of events in the field. He has to stop trying to think he's going to make, uh, in his history courses, make his students historians. They are there not to learn how to be historians. They're there to learn from history. They're there to learn about history. And I know professors have a, a horror uh, of, of every year reinventing the wheel. But I'm sorry, our students don't know the wheel exists. They don't know anything about the wheel. It has to be every year reinvented for them. So we run against the professionalism and the specialization in the universities. We run against the idea that uh, uh, the old foundational course, let's use uh, American history and Western Civ as, as paradigmatic uh, models, uh, uh, that they have to go uh, for political reasons. And we are left with a shell of the liberal arts. We're left with the same shell that the uh, uh, that my uh, my Iraqi orphans had. Uh, that we know that the liberal arts are to teach us about 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 Fagan and Shylock. No, no, the liberal arts are a treasure. They're a wealth. Uh, uh, the liberal arts make make us see the world in all its in all its complexity. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and all its regularity as well. Uh, again, another paradox. Uh, that's, that was what, okay, uh, foundational then, foundational courses, uh, foundational instruction. Uh, start at the beginning and don't try to, don't try to teach your dissertation, but it, that's death. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and engage your students, not by lecturing to them, but by asking, by, by encouraging them to ask naive questions. Uh, don't, don't, and don't take modern, the modern way as, as set and true, and therefore everything before that was benighted and maybe even evil. Uh, you know, 
there may be reasons why uh, we, we want to study history other than to make fun of it. So one of the things that for certain has happened over the past 40 years, in addition to uh, your argument about the changes in the liberal arts, is the diversification in our society, um, uh, the increase in diverse populations, emphasis more on women having a voice at the table. And I guess I'm wondering what you would say to people listening to you saying, here's another older white guy who can't acknowledge how diverse our society has become and that we have a desire to reflect that diversity in our education. What would your response be to that? Um, we are a diverse society. We are intentionally a diverse society. Uh, if by that you mean America. Uh, uh, we are... Uh, and by studying, how shall I put this? I have no, I, and, and the, the liberal arts were meant to be diverse. They were meant to be multicultural. My worry about contemporary diversity and multiculturalism is that it puts students into their boxes rather than getting out of their boxes. That in fact, Instead of studying Western civilization, you'll study uh, uh, simply not, not history, but women's history or black history or Italian history. Uh, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have made the liberal arts into a group of uh, discreet and often antagonistic uh, boxes. Uh, uh, identities when indeed the, per, the the promise of the liberal arts was it would have you let you see more uh, I have no doubt that that uh, you could see women when was it that women could not learn didn't learn from the study of Shakespeare from the from from listening to to, 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 to great music from being exposed to fine art from understanding how where we began and how we got to where we are, how would that be uh, uh, a uh, a non-education for them of the highest order? Uh, now, it could be that, and, and if indeed uh, there are great authors who are women, uh, as there are great scientists or great composers, as there are. They should be in what we used to call the canon. They should be in there. And if, in fact, they are really, they are really uh, uh, speaking uh, uh, to us all in important and, and instructive ways, that they weren't in there is a mistake. That kind of multiculturalism I'm perfectly happy and in full agreement with. But the multiculturalism that says uh, uh, Chicano studies is a great advance uh, uh, study of Western civilization is a sin, uh, that strikes me as just misguided. We're at the halfway point of our conversation about the value of liberal arts education to individuals and society with John Agresto, whose new book is called The Death of Learning. Uh, and uh, we're talking about some of the pressures on liberal arts education in our society. Uh, let's spend a little bit more time on that because you referenced some of it. In addition to uh, the what's been happening in the coursework and perhaps some of the socialization or politicization of liberal arts education, there's also a real economic issue attached to them. Uh, in a cost-value world, which you talked about before, where does a liberal arts education fit in a desire for students to find employment in a tech-centered world? Oh, don't get me on this. <laughs> I think I already have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it is criminal. I think it is a crime that colleges charge fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year so that you could read and study and discuss and examine great ideas, great books, uh, uh, significant events in history, uh, and charge the same amount to people who are, who are uh, studying 
uh, advanced sciences, uh, studying to become uh, captains of industry, uh, uh, studying to enter the aerospace industry, studying to be, uh, uh, well, you can name it. Uh, uh, there are those who have uh, financial prospects ahead of them that are golden. Uh, no one would say that about a person who spends his time, her time, studying uh, English literature, poetry, uh, history, uh, Latin, Greek, classics. Uh, now, I do talk in the book about, about somebody like Anthony Fauci, who has actually, uh, although I didn't put it in terms of money making, but he made a wonderful career in the in the med in medical sciences. Uh, and in virology and, 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 and related fields by, by being a classics major uh, at, at, uh, uh, at, at Fordham. Uh, uh, but, the, but the truth is uh, colleges uh, that used to always say that the liberal arts were the crown jewel in the, in, uh, of their studies, of their work, uh, uh, always treated it like uh, as the same cash cow that they that they treated other things. That's insane. Uh, it doesn't cost money. Most of the books you read in the liberal arts are not even copyrighted anymore. They're past their copyright dates. They're, you can you you can get them you get them very inexpensively, and you can get them online for free. Uh, so number one, uh, uh, you're right. The, the 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 pressure, the financial pressures on the liberal arts, okay, on that one aspect, are terrible. Uh, the financial, the financial uh, results of studying the liberal arts are never as rosy as studying uh, uh, pre-med, uh, becoming a uh, uh, going to going to law school. I have nothing against pre-med. I have nothing against going to law school. Absolutely not. I think the liberal arts can learn a lot from them. Uh, but one thing we can't learn is how to turn a degree in lyric poetry. Uh, into a, into a money making career, it's kind of difficult, uh, and uh, uh, so so what happens is that uh, students say, uh, and under pressure from parents, under pressure from themselves, uh, uh, I have to I have to make a living. Okay, I have to become a, I have to become a, 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 a person in in finance. I have to become uh, an accountant, or I have to become whatever it might be uh, that uh, I have to study computer technology, I have to study computer science, fine. Uh, uh, and you will make more money by studying those things. But you will, and you will make contributions to your, to your family, to yourself, your family and your community and, and to the country, maybe to the world by doing that. Uh, I just wanted to show how important it was uh, since I don't believe money is everything, I managed to live, live a nice life without very much money, uh, uh, how you can make an important contribution to the world by knowing something about human psychology, by knowing something about the roots of democratic uh, civilizations, uh, by knowing something about the rule of law, by knowing something about justice, by knowing something about tyranny, by knowing something about, you name the stuff, the liberal arts, talk about. And indeed, by following your desire to know about uh, things human, things natural, uh, and maybe even things divine, uh, that the liberal arts, while they won't make you rich, might make you smarter, make you smarter about things that matter. And so, that's the important thing. Since you've referenced uh, Anthony Fauci, we found a clip of him in our video library talking about his liberal arts education. Let's listen. So when I went to Regis High School, we took four years of Greek, four years of Latin, a romance language and ancient history and things like that. When I went to Holy Cross, which is another Jesuit school as a college, um, I took kind of a hybrid pre-med course. It was called, it's almost an oxymoron, it was called AB Greek Classics Dash Pre-Med. So you were majoring in the humanities and the classics with a lot of philosophy, but you took enough science to get into medical school. Do you know whether or not there are 
pre-med programs or even medical school programs that continue to emphasize the liberal arts? I, I honestly don't know if there are. Uh, uh, there may be. I would hope there would be. Uh, and I'm sorry I said he went to Fordham when he went to uh, Holy Cross. Uh, my brother went to Fordham, so I'm not going to praise it. Uh, uh, and I went to Boston College, so I shouldn't praise Holy Cross. Uh, uh, but, but no, he's, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. He, he was taught uh, how to be curious, how to have imagination, how to think things through by having a, basically a classical liberal education at Regis High School. Uh, uh, was the was as, as as good a high school as any in the world uh, back then when he went. Uh, it didn't. Liberal arts do not close doors for you, and in fact, they open doors to, in your mind to so much out there. I mean, I th I always feel bad for students who say, "I know what I want to do for the rest of my life." What a cage you've built for yourself, young man or young lady. Uh, you know what you want to do for the rest of your life? Uh, you began this by talking about the, all the things I did. I, I've had a fabulous life. I've, I've been a professor. I've been a college administrator. I founded a, helped found the university. I've, I've, I've been in war zones, uh, and I don't mean just Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, uh, I wouldn't have traded that for all the security that comes with uh, having, by knowing uh, what lucrative career I wanted to follow when I was a kid. Let me talk about, uh, have you talk about rather, an, an example that is at the opposite end of the spectrum. If there's a lot of pressure on universities uh, to offer the kind of broad coursework that you described under the rubric of liberal arts, an opposite example is St. John's College which you ran for 10 years, their Santa Fe campus. It's based in Annapolis, Maryland from the 1700s, all centered around the Great Books program. So what's happening with student interest in signing up for a four-year Great Books college experience? Are, are they still able to recruit students? And what kind? Yeah, yeah the, the, uh, uh, they are able to uh, uh, not only recruit students, uh, uh, but it's hard. It's 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 uh, uh, it's hard, and they and they and they have been able, uh, especially recently, to to make it more affordable to keep down costs, and that's very important uh, because we know we're losing students uh, uh, to those fields uh, that 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 promised them uh, uh, great wealth, fame, notoriety, and pleasure. Uh, uh, we, we, we'll, give, we'll give them, uh, we'll, we'll, we just make them smarter. Uh, no, uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, uh, most high school guidance counselors say, oh, you should be a, and not you should go to a liberal arts college. Uh, and, and they try to find out, well, what are you interested in? Well, I'm interested in computers. Okay, okay, this is a good place to go and study computers. As I said before, uh, even students should, we have to do a better job as liberal arts institutions, teaching them that if they think that way, they're shortchanging themselves. Uh, they, they, they really can see the world uh, before they decide what part of the world they want to tackle. If indeed they want to tackle only one part of the world, uh, they may want to be, uh, uh, smart about all kinds of things uh, and 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 I and the, some people find that very I worry about people finding a way of living that's satisfying uh, intellectually satisfying uh, uh, as well as financially secure I mean my father I talk about in the book my father he had the, he had the right idea uh, by somebody's or by some light certainly by his own uh, that if I that if I quit school, uh, and went and worked on the docks. I'd make a lot of money and always have money to support my family when, when it came along and, and to, and to uh, have, a, you know, have a nice house, have a nice car, uh, and, uh, and you know, not bad. Uh, I just said I really want to know more about, I want to know more about language. I want to know about music. I want to know more about, I want to know more about, about imagination. 
I want to know more about reading and great reading. I want to know more about great people. I want to know more about evil people. I want to know. I want to know about. I want to know about the the Hitlers and Stalins of the world, as well as the you know the uh, uh, as well as about about Christ and about George Washington. I want to know all those. All those things are going to make make me understand the world in ways I think important for me. Uh, but yeah, I, had I gone to work on the docks, I would have learned a lot. Uh, the truth is, as I say in the beginning of the book, I, I won't think I learned more and learned it more easily by studying uh, Homer. Uh, if I want to, if I want to meet up with with uh, Achilles, I'd rather meet him in the pages of Homer than meet him on the docks in in, in, in Brooklyn. So uh, so far, our focus has been on higher education. Uh, but you argue in The Death of Learning that a real opportunity and responsibility by educators is at the high school level. Can you talk more about that? With the we, knowledge uh, that 40% of all high school graduates don't go to, uh, on to further education. Yeah. Uh, uh, oddly enough, I, 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 sometimes I, I, get, I confuse myself as to what the origins of this book were. Uh, and I always say, what's my experience in in uh, in in teaching in higher education in a college administration? Uh, but the other part of it, and sometimes even the more important part, maybe even the better part of it, was going to high school and working with high school teachers. Uh, I say something that that I. Uh, I say in the book, even though I went to a school, a high school called Brooklyn Preparatory School, I've grown to hate the phrase preparatory school because it seems to say that high schools are just the, the table setters for the feast that's going to follow later. We're going to prepare you for the real thing. We're going to prepare you for your real education. We're going to prepare you for college or go to university. When in fact, I think my my high school education and I think many people's high school education, uh, and especially as you say, many people, that's the end of their education. If they don't learn about the world, if they don't see the world in all its, in all its complexity and uniformity, all its, all its craziness and all its wonder, if they don't see that, at least begin to see that in high school, they will never see it. Uh, and that's a great burden on high school teachers. The most important education most students will ever have is with you in high school. You are the one who is going to teach them who, uh, who, who Shakespeare was and what he wrote and have them read it and, and have, them, have, them, have them internalize it. You are the one who's going to introduce them to, to logic, to philosophy. You're the one who's going to introduce them to history so they know uh, uh, what's, what, what's out there. Uh, uh, I'm I'm amazed at uh, I just saw the PBS series uh, Ken Burns' series on the Holocaust spectacular spectacular piece of work uh, and what an education Ken Burns must have that he can go into fields that range from baseball to the Civil War to the Holocaust but there all I keep hearing is we didn't we didn't know this was going on we didn't know about the ship called the St. Louis uh, uh, the high school students should be exposed to that kind of. They should they should know the the wonders of the world and the evils of the world. Uh, they should they should not be terribly surprised. Uh, and uh, and and my great hope is that uh, that the more they know, the more they learn, the more they see. Oh, what we have and what we don't have, what, uh, what we are and what the alternatives are to what we have, uh, that the that the natural fanaticism of people, uh, and I may be going overboard there, but that people want to uh, to be uh, uh, to be uh, so right uh, uh, and have their views so promoted uh, that they become. Uh, uh, well, I remember back in high school, Father Fjork saying, Cave homo venius libri, beware the man of one book. Because people who only study one thing, who have only one book, become fanatics, become extremists, become even terrorists, I don't know. Uh, uh, the great thing about the liberal arts is it might teach a little 
a moderation of 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 our own views and a moderation of our of our uh, of our enthusiasms uh, and that would be no small thing to give the world if there have been a lot of battles on university campuses about uh, who gets to speak and who doesn't what gets studied what doesn't it's nothing like what's been going on for the past few years at the high school level in states around the country about what books are read and what uh, what courses are taught. How do you see uh, the way we approach public education in this country coming around any consensus, even at the state level, on what a high school liberal arts education might look like today? I'm very disturbed that at, uh, what's been called the cancel culture, but and it's not just in universities, it's in uh, uh, it's in, 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 in the media, in print. Uh, I mean, I have to tell you that, uh, except for one uh, university press, uh, no university press would touch the book we're talking about. Uh, it took a private press to do that. Uh, 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 this cancel culture is real. This uh, 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 PC-ness is throughout not just higher education, but throughout uh, uh, the society in general. Uh, But I haven't, and and it's coming not from the left only, it's coming from the right and the left. In fact, these days it seems to be coming from the right as much as if not more than from the left. Uh, uh, And I'm going to make, I'm going to distress all my my conservative and uh, right-wing confreres here by saying, you know, critical race theory, should be taught, at least in colleges, yeah, uh, maybe even in high schools. Uh, 1619 Project, yeah, yeah. Uh, so long as you have them also read uh, uh, Thomas Paine, Jefferson, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, that, if you, that if you have, uh, not that I believe that everything in the liberal arts has to be a debate, uh, but I do believe that uh, we talked about multiculturalism before. The, the multiculturalism of viewpoints and ideas about important things is crucial. Uh, and so uh, I wouldn't ban teaching uh, the 1619 Project, but I would definitely have them read uh, uh, Bernard Balin and Gordon Wood on the foundations and the, uh, of the American Republic, on the ideological, philosophical foundations of the American Republic, about the growth of freedom. I'd have them read uh, not only those uh, uh, the critical race theory books, uh, uh, arguments or understand them, but, but have them look at uh, Bill McClay's latest book, uh, Land of Hope, on, on the sweep of American history and how we, how we begin with an idea and how we try to develop and understand that idea. And that idea is not uh, that, uh, that slavery is good, but the idea that is uh, slavery is really an evil. Uh, but what do we do about it? Uh, and so, uh, yes, you're right to raise the question of uh, uh, silencing on college campuses. Now even, so, and, and uh, it used to always be that, if we think back to the McCarthy era before, uh, people got silenced by the government. Uh, uh, professors got silenced. Uh, uh, now it's worse than that. The government still works to silence different views, but now the university itself works to silence different views. That's really a tragedy. I don't know. This is why the book is almost a eulogy for the liberal arts. I don't know how we would stand this this pincer action, this double-barreled attack on 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 thinking, on thought, on argument, on understanding. On, on understanding the, the diversity that, that's really out there in, in the world of knowing. Uh, uh, it's, it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful. I want you to listen to the president of Yale uh, at, just in August of this year uh, with remarks he made about a bias towards openness. In a university setting, we must be able to distinguish emphatically legitimate dissent from outright deceit. We must make room for beliefs we find objectionable as faithfully as we reject falsehoods we know to be lies. And we must therefore 
nurture a bias toward openness, even and especially when this ethos exposes us to points of view that test our most strongly held assumptions. Such a climate affords the search for truth and the credibility necessary to trust it. John Agresto, I think he is espousing your point of view that need to be exposed to all sorts of ideas in today's world. I guess in the five minutes we have left, I wanted to, to ask you about where you see uh, some seeds of uh, different approaches to this for people who are like-minded to your point of view. Where do you see interesting changes going on, experiments being made of people trying to reintroduce the liberal arts in either university or high school levels? There really are places that are, that are working hard at this. Uh, uh, I know there are some, uh, in high schools, uh, I said, in fact, I said to one of my colleagues the other day, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm about to despair over, over, over the teaching in high schools, uh, I think I think teachers in high schools are not interested. He says, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. They're very interested. They're a little worried. They're a little scared. They may not know everything how to do it. But they really do want people to learn languages. They really do want people to learn real history. They really do want their students uh, to know something about about the, the world and, and, and all its, and all its wonders. They really do. Sometimes they have you know, funny slogans like we're going to teach uh, uh, critical thinking or whatever it might be, and that would be narrow. Or we're going to teach you how to be how to be better people. Or, um, or we're going to use the liberal arts uh, to, to uh, uh, so you can get a good job in the aerospace industry. Or you know, you know, they really just want to teach solid subjects at a uh, to everyone. Uh, so I, I I think I think we have we have to have faith and hope. In our in our in our in our teachers, uh, pre collegiate teachers, uh, colleges, uh, there are in, there are a, a growing number of, of universities and colleges, and I want to emphasize the word colleges there as well, because very often these get pushed aside because they're well they're not universities they're sort of low class universities not true not true. Uh, some of the I've taught at universities, I've taught at colleges. Some of the best teaching and the best learning takes place sometimes in colleges, residential, liberal arts colleges, sometimes sectarian colleges, uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, just old-fashioned uh, colleges. Uh, there are places like that. Uh, how heartening it is to hear the president of Yale talk like that. But you could hear that at, at Yale. You could hear that at Chicago. You could hear that at Princeton. You could hear that at Purdue. Uh, uh, these are not uh, these are not aberrant thoughts. Uh, uh, some of us feel like we've been just pushed to our limit, and I'm glad to see the president of Yale has been pushed to his limit, and he's coming out fighting. Uh, there are places like that, uh, small, regional sectarian sometimes, and sometimes big, imposing, impressive, and important places like Yale. So perhaps the book is not a eulogy after all. Well, uh, you're pushing me to be more optimistic than I usually am, but so thank you for that. Well, that's it for our hour together. Uh, tell people again about your book, and should also mention that in the appendix you have a letter to high school seniors and also a letter to high school educators uh, with, with specifics about your message on the liberal arts. The book is called The Death of Learning, How American Education Has Failed Our Students and What to Do About It. Dr. John Agresto, our guest for the last hour. Thanks for spending time with C-SPAN. Thank you so much, Susan. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 